The book of Jonah will help us as we uh, focus on these things. And the title of the message this morning is Running From Instead of Preaching To. Running from instead of preaching to. And maybe we ought to rephrase that and turn it around and said, and say instead say preaching to instead of running from. Because in, in reality, that's what God would have you and I to accomplish. But what do we see from the life of Jonah? We see they running from instead of of preaching too. Now, I know this story is a very familiar story with many of you. I know this is a book of the Bible that you've probably read uh, multiple times, and so uh, for that sake, uh, it should be an easy listen, all right, because you uh, don't have a lot of things to uh, figure out about it. However, I trust the Lord will teach you something new through it and and help uh, emphasize for you Uh, This idea of letting other people know, sharing Jesus Christ uh, with others. You know, the the reality is is we don't know how much time we have left to proclaim the gospel. But one thing that we do know is when our time is up, there's no more proclaiming the gospel. And so this is something that you cannot do in heaven, but something that you can do uh, here on earth, and that's to share Christ. The first thing I want you to see from the life of Jonah found here in Jonah chapter 1 is the refusal to go. The refusal to go. Jonah said no. Jonah said no. Now in the the concept of this refusal that we see here, there's a clear command, and that's in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of uh, uh, Amit Tei, saying, how would you like you have your father's name that, all right? Uh, uh, hey, Dad, how's it going? Uh, I would stick with Dad instead of Amit Tei. But anyways, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. This, uh, this clear command was clearly the word of the Lord. And in the word of the Lord, he tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And in going to Nineveh, I've got a message that I want you to specifically declare to the inhabitants of that city. Now, this uh, clear command is no different than what you and I have received. Uh, We know the same word exists in the New Testament in regards to uh, our church going and preaching the gospel. Go ye into all the world. Go ye and preach the gospel to every creature, all right? Uh, That's clear what the Bible says for us, a command that I think is very easy to understand. Amen? Amen. Anybody have any issue with that command? I don't mean obeying it, I mean understanding it, all right? Uh, uh, An issue of that command is for you and I to go and preach Christ, to go and share the gospel. Now, as we see in our own life, when we see in the life of Jonah too many times, there's that rebellious response, that rebellious response in verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. He rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Now, I want you to understand something here. This next phrase is kind of key. From the presence of the Lord. It didn't necessarily matter where he went. The key is is for Jonah and his situation is he wanted to get away from God. He wanted to get out of the presence of God. He wanted to get away from God. From that command. Now there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, if I'm out of earshot of God, then I can't hear what he's telling me. Hello? Anybody else listening? (laughs) My kids try that on occasion. They do. They get so that we're a place where they can't hear me tell them something specific and you see it because because you notice you know you come in and and then you and and they're almost anticipating dad's going to tell me to do something specific and so since dad's going to tell me to do that if I just kind of sneak out and get over here and dad doesn't see me then dad's not going to be able to tell me or at least he's going to have to work a little bit harder because then he's going to have to come find me and come get me you know and so uh, they'll hang out in their secret hiding places every once in a while but uh, that's kind of the way it was with Jonah he figured this command that is very clear and concise I don't want anything to do with and so I'm going to run away I'm going to get away from where 
I'm going to get away from the presence of God so He can't speak to me. And that's just like you and I do in our life, especially with this aspect of witnessing. If we're not willing to go and we don't want to go share Christ, what are we going to do? We are going to occupy ourselves with other things in other places so that we don't hear the nagging command of God that we need to go and preach the gospel. In this rebellious response, Jonah goes the opposite direction from Nineveh. Uh, the place that he was supposed to go. In fact, you look on a map, and uh, at least for me, my sake, all right, Nineveh, I'll, I'll do it for yours. Nineveh's over here, and uh, Tarsus is way over here off the coast of, uh, right on the coast of uh, a Rome area, okay? And so he was going to go all the way across the Mediterranean Sea to a, a, another uh, almost continent, it seemed like, all right? And, and get away from that direction because he knew God wanted him to go to Tarsus. And so as he's fleeing the presence of the Lord, he's going the opposite direction. And the Bible talks about going down. Uh, going down to Joppa, and, and uh, Joppa was fairly close to Jerusalem, but it was on the coast, and so he could pick up a ship there. Elevation-wise, we could see it going down. Uh, and then uh, it says he paid a fare thereof and went down uh, into it to go with them unto Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Again, what is Jonah doing? He's trying to get away from God. Now, I don't know how you have and how you've really viewed this aspect of not witnessing to others. But we need to view it the way God views it. When God gives a command and we don't obey, what is that called? Disobedience or rebellion. And it seems like the more that we know what God wants us to do, the more we try to get away from it and get outside of it and, and get involved in something else so we're preoccupied so we don't have to do it. Let's learn from Jonah this morning. Let's get back to that clear command of God. Now thank the, thankfully in this uh, chapter, in this refusal to go, we have the anticipatory action of God. God anticipates what Jonah's going to do. Look at verse 4. But the Lord. You know, you got to love it when God butts in, don't you? <laughs> but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid. Not the Seattle ones, all right? Uh, these are actually real mariners. And cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship unto the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Now that's a good, good illustration for you and I about the rebellious response to God's command to go, is we love to get out there and just go to sleep and, and, and simply don't listen to God anymore. Now I don't see how somebody sleeps in a ship that is in this kind of uh, storm, in this kind of, of turmoil. I have a, a little bit of uh, a speculation is, is in his, in his uh, a striving uh, with God and in his fight against God's command and trying to get away from God, it probably wore him out. And so he was so exhausted by this point that he could sleep through such a storm. Now, some of you probably just say Jonah was a heavy sleeper, and maybe he was, all right? Maybe he was like uh, those of the Billingmeyer family that I've uh, come in contact with on occasion that can just sleep anywhere, anytime, all right? Uh, uh, but I don't know. I, I do know, though, that Jonah was asleep in the midst of a, a major tempestuous ocean or, or sea that God had had uh, brought about that God created because why God is anticipating what Jonah is going to do so God in his foreknowledge already knows all these things you know you and I think we're going to trick God when in reality we're only tricking ourselves because God knows if you're going to hear this message and obey tomorrow or obey today He's going to know when you walk out of here if you're going to grab some tracts or if you're going to share Christ with others or if you're going to uh, get busy writing that personal testimony of, that you have to be able to share with others. 
The Lord knows how you're going to respond and how you're going to either rebel and refuse or listen and go about and do it. And so he's going to be already preparing things around you to help you and I to obey. That's just the way God works. And so if it's a storm, it's a storm. And this it's a, uh, the way Jonah, uh, 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 Jonah's story uh, unfolds. But God utilizes whatever means necessary in order to work in your life and in my life. All right, And that's a truth that we can learn from this book. That's also a truth that we can learn throughout the Word of God that will help you and I in this concept of witnessing to others, preaching to instead of running from. Now in verse 6, the story gets pretty interesting here. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon yours truly, Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil has come of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? And what is thy country? And of what people art thou? And in verse 9 he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. In verse 10, Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? Now I want you to notice this next statement. This is something I've never picked up before on. For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, <clears throat> To me, this is an interesting aspect of the story. First of all, it tells you how stupid these sailors were. I guess, I don't know exactly when Jonah told them. Maybe he had already paid his fare and maybe he had already gotten on the ship. And then as he was going ready to go down to the ship and fall asleep, maybe he told them, by the way, guys, I'm running from God, just in case you're wondering. Maybe it was at the dock. Where are you going? I don't care where. I'm just going opposite of that direction and I'm trying to get away from God. But they took him in and they, 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 they had him on board. And then when this storm starts to occur, they run down there and wake him up and say, man, what's wrong with you? What is your occupation? Where are you from? What God do you serve? Now Jonah had the wits about him enough to say, the real God. The one who controls, oh yeah, the sea. The creation. And then these guys with this knowledge of already understanding that he was running from God. Now, in their mindsets, they, they were worshipers of other gods. We see all these other things that are going on in their life. But now they're starting to recognize here, this man actually is a worshiper of the true God. Now, isn't this wonder how God works? Do you realize that even in our rebellion, God can work through our hearts? and work through our lives to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, I, I know that God intended for him to go to Nineveh, and I know that Jonah uh, refused and, and disobeyed and went the other direction, but I also know that God has such infinite wisdom that he orchestrates so many things in such a perfect manner that he still can get glory from your life even when you disobey him, even when I refuse to do what's right. And so what's happening? Well, instead of him witnessing right now to the Ninevites, he's witnessing to these sailors. He's witnessing these guys on the ship, and all of a sudden they're realizing that God really is the real God. Now in verse 11, Then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And, and he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth in the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. 
Now the guys, they don't listen right away. They try to row harder. They try to bring it back to the land, but it was too much. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, verse 14, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, has done as it pleased thee. These guys all of a sudden get right with God. And they realize, uh oh, we're getting ready to throw a prophet of the real God over. We better be careful. So, Lord, before we do this, please understand something. This is not our choice. This is not what we want to do. We don't want his, his life to be on our hands because then we know the ship's going to go down. But this is what he's saying to do. We're out of options. In verse 15, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth in the sea, and the sea ceased from a raging. Now, let's notice here. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. What an impression. He proclaimed it even though he was running from the commandment of God. Now I want you to think, again, I'm talking about this concept here that God anticipates our action. He anticipates our decision. He anticipates our choice, right? We know that he knew that Jonah was going to get a ship, and he knew which one. He knew where it was. He knew which direction it was going to go, but he also knew which direction Jonah needed to go. And so he creates a storm. But do you realize that God doesn't stop there? Instead, God has already in his mind, this is the things that are going to happen. Verse 17 now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, I'm not sure how he prepared this fish. Maybe he glued its mouth shut so that it couldn't eat for a day and a half, and so it was real hungry, and so when it saw a little man floating in the water, it thought, hey, I think this will be dinner enough for me. Maybe he prepared it by bringing it from a certain direction and bringing it uh, to that particular location. I don't know. God prepared the fish. He made this great fish prepared, ready to swallow up Jonah. Now, I, I, think about this again. We're so familiar with these stories. We don't ever put ourselves there. We don't think about it as much as we should. You're on a ship. How many of you have ever been on a ship, all right? How many have ever been in a storm on a ship? Lauren, I'm sorry, but she was on a cruise ship. That ship was as big as the storm, all right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, when you think about it here, these guys are getting tossed and turned, and this is a huge thing to point. They feel like they are going to sink. Now, I've been on a, a boat out in the middle of the uh, ocean, but just, you know, eight-foot swells is probably as big as I've been in, and that's, that's plenty, all right? But you get it to much more, and you think you're going to die. Now, think about this, though. Be the one that has to get thrown in. What was going through Jonah's mind? God told me to go. I refused. The storm is for me. God's done with me. Guys, to save your life, I'm going to have to take mine. I don't know why he needed them to throw him over. He could have just jumped, you know. But he needed a little help. He didn't have to walk the plank. He just got tossed, right? So here he is in this, in this ocean, and we know that the sea um, calms. But prior to the sea calming, how long was Joseph in the water? Jonah, not Joseph, Jonah. What were these other guys thinking? I mean, in a huge, in a huge storm, they probably lost sight of him almost immediately. And I'm not sure how long he was able to even stay afloat. I mean, you can swim, you can tread water a little bit, but waves get so big, it will splash you over, whatever. It doesn't appear that he died before the fish got to him. But God, in his perfect timing, knew what he was doing, anticipating every move of everyone involved and was working in amazing ways. Now this fish he prepares comes up and swallows Jonah. And it was a big enough fish for Jonah to live inside of it. He had oxygen in there. And I guess, uh, scientifically speaking, it's possible. Not anything I want to try to prove right, but probable. We get into verse, or chapter 2 and we see here the renewal to obey. 
the renewal to obey. Verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. The first thing you see is repentance. Repentance. There in the fish's belly he's crying out to God, I was wrong. There in the fish's belly he talks to the Lord. There in the fish's belly he recognizes that he did not do the way God wanted him to do. Now this is important for you and I and everything that that we understand. Even this whole thing about witnessing. The reality is, is you and I probably missed opportunities this past week to witness for whatever reason. It was a refusal of some sort. Whether it was ignorance uh, because we simply ignored whatever God was leading us to do or because we made ourselves unavailable or because we knew what God wanted we went the opposite direction. I don't know which one it was for you. I I, I can only describe Concern what was going on in my life, but I do know this, that the moment I recognize it, God wants me to come to Him and ask forgiveness. God wants me to repent for not being the kind of witness that I should be. From running from instead of preaching to, God wants me to say, Lord, I'm sorry. It begins with that repentance. The Lord prays unto Joseph, but then number two, though, it, 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 it continues on with a reasoning a reasoning, and I want you to understand what I mean by this because sometimes we get into this reasoning concept and we think, well, we got to work it out in our minds. No, this reasoning, what I see here in Jonah's life, look at it. It says in verse 2, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep and in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about. All the billows and the waves passed over me. That's what happened when he was in the water. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yea, I will look again toward thy holy temple. I'm done. My life's over. I'm finished because I refuse to obey. I'm going to, only thing I have for to look to right now is heaven. And I'm not even sure if I'm really excited about getting there right now. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about, the, about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. O oh Lord my God. This reasoning here that goes on in Jonah's life, right? He realizes very quickly and, and just immediately the things that have happened to me is because God anticipated my disobedience, my rebellion, and now I'm experiencing it. Now I want you to understand this because this is an extremely important point for you and me. I'm afraid too many people miss what God is trying to do in their life. Because they don't take the time to really think through what is going on. Why are these things happening to me? What is happening to me? Why is this going on? And why is that going on? Where am I in in, in relation to my life with God? And I've seen it over and over again where people get headstrong in their path. They're refusing to listen to God's clear command. All these things are happening to them and they simply just act like it's not. Learn from the life of Jonah. I keep saying Joseph, I'm sorry. Learn from the life of Jonah. At least he had enough sense to say, I know why the storm take place. I know why I'm now in the stomach of a great fish. I don't know what kind it is, but it's nasty. I know why I have seaweed wrapped around my head. I know why it stinks. I know why I'm going deep, deep, deep down farther than I've ever gone before. You know, an interesting aspect about this too, I think, is God gave them a little glimpse as to what the Ninevites were going to experience if they didn't hear somebody claim and preach that they needed to repent. He even uses the word hell there. And I don't think he's talking about the literal hell that happens when those that are without Christ die and experience. But I think he's getting a little taste of darkness and the depths and the smell, and the disgust, and all the other things that can come about when a person refuses salvation and pays for their sin themselves in a place called 
hell. There's reasoning with this renewal to obey. But then there's also remembrance. Look at it, verse 7, chapter 2. When my soul fainted within me, what does it say? I remembered the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for the brains He's given to us, right? Thank God for the ways He's worked. Thank God for the impressions He's made. Then I remembered the Lord. And that, that's what's got to happen for us to have this renewal to obey. Because as long as we continue to ignore God and forget God and, and just pass Him, push Him off and push Him away, it's not going to happen. But as the Lord says, repent, I'll forgive. Here's what you're going through, understand it. Then we remember Him. And what does it say here? They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. In His remembrance, He starts recalling these lessons that God has taught Him. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that thou I, that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. His renewal here with, the, with, with uh, obedience is a renewal of his relationship with God. His renewal with the obedience to go back and do what God has commanded begins with the not fleeing from the presence of God, but coming back to the presence of God. And it's uh, ironic that it has to happen in the, in the belly of a whale. It's ironic it has to happen in the depths of the sea when God has to get him into a captive position with disgust around him in order to get his attention. But sometimes it's the way it is for you and me. The important thing is this, though. Get back into the presence of God and say, Okay, God, I got it. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. Verse 10, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. Now, I, you know, I know that we have more technology than they had back then. Could you imagine if that technology that we have now was back then and somebody got a GoPro view of that fish <laughs> throwing up Jonah on the, on the water? I mean, that would have made national headlines. I wish I'd had rights to that video, you know. You would have become a millionaire to spread the gospel all around the world. I mean, I'm hoping the Lord will show it to us when we get up there, all right, when we get up to heaven. But what a sight that must have been. I mean, God had a specific location pointed out. He had prepared that fish. He knew that fish. He knew where Jonah was. And he said, all right, I've got his attention. How long did it take? Three nights in there. Now? And by the way, doesn't that talk about God's foreknowledge? Because Jesus uses that about himself. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, or the, the fish, for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man. Here it is. He throws him up. And now there's a renewal to obey. But, in, but number three, chapter three, also the reinstatement of the mission. The reinstatement of the mission. I mean, this is just... It's amazing how God works. But in Jonah chapter 3, the Lord says this, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. The preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three, three days' journey and, and uh, so on and so forth. But let me, let me, let me just... Stop there for a second and say a couple of different things about this reinstatement of the mission. Do you realize that today we serve a merciful God? Amen. Anybody ever messed up before? Anybody like me that deserves God to have already been done with me and quit giving me any opportunities to, to continue on? Our God is a merciful God. We look at Jonah and say, man, you were stupid, buddy. But you know, he only did it once. <laughs> and now what about you? What about me? But the Bible says God said unto him a second time. A second time. Brother Patrick, he gave him another chance. Now we don't always do that to other people, but God does do it to us. God is merciful. Now I think it's important to learn and I think it's important to take a, advantage of the second chance. But I think it's no different than you and I right here, right now. Maybe this past week, you didn't do any witnessing. 
You didn't share Christ with anyone. Guess what? There's a good chance that God's going to give you opportunity this week to do it. This week to share Christ. This week to declare Jesus to uh, someone else. He is a merciful God. But, the, but another aspect of this reinstatement of this mission is to understand that it's the message of God that you and I need to share. He says there that in verse 2, uh, preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Don't be putting your words in it. Don't be putting your message to it. You listen and you hear what I have to say and that's what I want you to share with the Ninevites. And I think the Lord has J Jonah's uh, attention now. Uh, he not only went out of the presence of God and got away and God orchestrated all these events to have him puked up on the shore, but now he's saying to him, Jonah, listen, I got a message you need to take my message. And Jonah's saying, aye, aye, captain. You can pilot a fish. You certainly got my attention now. And then it continues on with the moving of God. The moving of God. Jonah rose and he went into Nineveh. You know, the New Testament talks about it when Jesus is sharing a, a, a parable, a, a precept, a principle. He talks about which, which one of these fellows do you think did the will of God? And I know I'm a little paraphrasing here, but he gave two examples. He said, first of all, there was the, uh, the Judah, all right? And Judah said, I told him, Judah, it's time to go out and pick up the yard. And Judah said, yes, sir, daddy, I will do that. And he heads off to the living room before he gets to the back door and he finds a book, and he sits down and starts reading his book. And then I look over to Jaden. Jaden, you need to get out there and pick up the yard. And Jaden looks right at me and says, no. Maybe I should use Jesse on that one, right? He's more apt to say no. Jaden says, no, I'm not going to go pick up the yard. And I say, Jaden, you and I have a little meeting in my office then. <laughs> and Jaden thinks for a second, and he says, I don't like meetings in the office. Dad, I'm sorry. I'll go. And he runs as fast as he can out that door and starts picking up. Which one did the will of the Father? It's pretty obvious, right? Who? Huh? Come on. Thomas, what's the answer? <laughs> Jaden. Jaden did the will of the Father. Even though he was the rebellious one, he's the one that went up doing it. Judah's still sitting on the couch reading his book, and I come in and see Judah reading his book, and now Judah is going to the office, and him and I have a special meeting uh, prepared. But this is what I think when we see from the life of Jonah here. Yes, he said no, but then he repented and he went. And it's better than you and I who say, yes, God, I know I'm supposed to go. And yes, Lord, I'll share Christ with, with someone, but don't do it. Jonah's doing the will of God, not you and me. We need to learn that. But in the process of this, it's the moving of God that helps him to reinstate that mission. And so he goes on. In verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. I'm sorry, let me go back to verse 4. So Jonah began to enter to the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He went into that city, and that city was so huge that if you started walking at the beginning of the city, you had to walk three days straight in order to get to the end of the city. And so Jonah makes it one day's journey into the city, and he starts to say these things. And yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He makes that message of judgment that God has proclaimed upon that city. And then verse 5, The people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even the least of them. And boy, they get right with God. They, they, they repent of, of what's going on in their life. They call a fast. They, they do all these things. And then God insists in verse 10, it says, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. Now, if we could stop Jonah's story right here, it would be a wonderful story. It would be an amazing story. I mean, you think about it, it would be one of the greatest revivals of all time. 
Because there, this city, this wicked, no good, rotten city has gotten right with God because of one man's message as he started to proclaim the Lord's going to judge in 40 days. But unfortunately, this morning, there's more to learn from the story of Jonah than just the, the great revival that happens. But I think it's a, an important lesson for you and I to understand. We go forward in the reinstatement of the mission. We go with God's message. We go because of a merciful God. We go with the moving of God. But one more thing I want to offer to you today, and that's this, the realization of my heart's motivation. The realization of my heart's motivation. And here's, here's what's going to make the difference for you and me whether we run from or we preach to. Whether we listen to God's command and go and preach the gospel or we run away from it and ignore it. Here it is in chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, now he's angry right now, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now there's a lot of things that are going to come out of this, all right? And I'm going to try to, uh, best I can, sum it up into some things that you and I can grab a hold of and you and I can understand. Here's one realization of my heart's motivation. I desire God's mercy but I do not feel that certain other people deserve it. I desire God's mercy. I want God to be merciful to me. But when I look around, I don't see others in the same position deserving the mercy of God. And so what does that cause me to do? Now, now you can think of it in this way, because some of you are saying, I'm not sure if I'm like that. You see somebody on the street, and, and maybe we're not even going to go with just a random individual. Let's talk about somebody that you know, somebody that you realize is, is, is deep in a sin or has hurt people or hurt you or uh, done things that you just can't even hardly fathom. And their lifestyle is such a lifestyle that it's like, man... You know what? Maybe, maybe they've, they, they've come against you before and so you're just flat out plain, I will not witness to that individual because the reality is they don't deserve God's mercy. Now heaven forbid we would ever think that, but you know, I think the reality is if we were to look deep in our hearts, we are going to see that sometimes that's there. Maybe it's not a specific individual. Maybe it's more of a group of people. We call that being prejudiced. Being prejudiced. And I don't care who you are, we all have prejudices in this life, okay? But you look at a certain group of people, and I don't mean just nationality or skin color. It could be, it could be the kind of uh, gang they hang out with. Maybe it's the drug addicts, all right? Maybe it's the, uh, the tattoo parlors. Anybody go by a tattoo parlor and just go, oh, how in the world could anybody walk into that place? That's disgusting, how many of you have gone drive, drive, drove by, all right? I'm not saying you walked into, but drove by a tattoo place and said, that would really be a great place to share the gospel. <gasps> not me. I'm sorry, i got to confess this one. Yeah, see? Tracy's going to get right with God too on this one. When we look at the life of Jonah, we say, Jonah, you're so dumb. You need to understand why Jonah wouldn't go. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Assyria was Israel's sworn enemy at this time. They were the ones conquering the world. We don't have time, but the wickedness that took place in the city of Nineveh was so detestable. It's hard to even talk about and that's why God saw it. 
And that's why God said, you know what? I'm done with that city. They are going to be annihilated. And Jonah's going, good job, God. It's about time. They've come against us. They've, 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 they've took, taken us captive. They've fought us. They've done all these things. They've killed us. And they, they've done all this to the, the, the children and all these other horrible things. God, wipe them off the earth. Amen. That's wonderful. And God takes Jonah through a few lessons to understand what mercy really is. But even then, when God shows mercy to Nineveh, Jonah says, I knew you were going to do that. That's why I did not want to go. That's why I did not want to say that. Because I was afraid that if they heard it and they actually repented, that you would change your mind and you'd give them mercy. Because that's the kind of God that you are. Listen to us. And if I share Christ with those individuals, they might get saved and then i got to spend eternity in heaven with them. Ugh. Yikes. By the way, they'll be perfect and so will you, so it won't matter. The people that we are called the witness to sometimes don't, I should say all the time, don't deserve the mercy of God. But there's still people that Christ came to die for. And there's people that God still wants to forgive. And they're no different than you and me. What is your motivation or your lack of motivation, or your improper motivation that either that keeps you and I from sharing Christ with others. You know, there's another interesting aspect of this place called Nineveh. It's the same modern day the soul in Iraq. You know what's going on there right now, right? It's the city that the ISIS have set up their headquarters in that currently, right now, we're about 80-some percent in taking it back. The city where the terrorists are hiding out, the ones that have killed innocent lives, the ones that have proclaimed war on America. The ones that in their zeal for their religion have said if they meet you, they need to kill you. Do I got any takers yet? I think that's kind of how it was for Jonah. But probably on a greater scheme because it wasn't 80% conquered. It was still 100% the enemy. And God says, I want you to go and declare my message to the, those people. You ever considered that place that you'd never want to go to share Christ with? I've thought about it. And I would say right now, the Middle East probably sums it up for me. Now, I'm not saying that so God sends me there tomorrow, right? I'm saying that because I'm reality identifying with Jonah. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to go to a place that more than likely will kill me instead of letting me proclaim Jesus Christ. So before you pronounce judgment on Jonah... Let's look and see what our motivation is. Some other aspects of it could be the things that I'm concerned about. The things that I'm concerned about. Whether it's, look at verse 4 of Jonah chapter 4. So Jonah went out of the city and, or, or I'm sorry, verse 4, Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. I guess he just didn't get it, did he? Lord, I knew you were going to be merciful to those people. So what are you waiting for, Jonah? <clears throat> you think God's going to change his mind because you're mad? And the Lord prepared a gourd, gourd, 
Now again, what's this God orchestrating in Jonah's life? That it might be a shadow over his head, deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Then God prepared a worm. When the morning rose, the next day it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Oh, my soul. What is Jonah thinking? Now you realize that he, that, that God is working this work within his heart and in the process of doing that, he's revealing to Jonah his motivation. He's revealing to him why he wouldn't go. He's revealing to him why he's mad now that he went and, and God's going to probably uh, have mercy and save this city. He's revealing to Jonah what's going on in his heart. And listen, you and I need that in our life today because if we're going to be witnesses for God, we need to know what's causing us not to be. We need to know what we need to have in our heart to allow us to become the kind of witnesses that God wants us to be. And here it is. Jonah was so concerned about these other things, his comfort in life, a plant that was providing him shade, he felt so sorry that this gourd, this plant, died because this worm killed it. And yet in the process of all that, he's looking at a city of three days journey's length and he's wanting them to die. Something's wrong with that. But folks, you know what? I see it right in my life. I see it in your life. It's one of those things that we get so concerned about our stuff. We get so concerned about our comforts here in this life that it keeps us from getting out there and sharing Christ with other people. And you know it's the case in your life and I know it's the case in my life. And we need to repent of that. Notice what Jesus says or God says in verse 10. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the Lord for that which thou hast not labored. Neither made a scroll, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And that's the same thing with the stuff that you have and the stuff that I have. You know what? God's given it to us. Don't think it's yours. And don't pretend that it's yours and don't act like that's all that's important in this world and that you want more of it. God's given it to you. Glorify Him with it. And don't let it stop you from reaching into the lost world that people need to hear Jesus Christ and get busy sharing the Lord with others. And he says in verse 11, Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. You know what that means? There was 120,000 young people in that city that didn't even have enough understanding at that moment in their life to know which my left hand and which my right hand is. And the Lord says to Jonah, you want me to wipe that city out with all those innocent people. You look around, the little children that are here this morning. Could you wish death and judgment upon them? And the Lord says, when I tell you to go, I want you to go. When I tell you to speak, I want you to speak. When I tell you to share Christ with others, there's a reason behind that. These innocent people who have never heard the story of salvation die in their sin and experience hell while you and I are sitting up on the hill shaded in the comfort of our house because we can sit care more about that than we do about them. Father, we come before you.